Before I was at Fermion, I did a lot of work on the .NET stack. I was a C-sharp programmer for 15 years. And this talk is kind of combining those two strands of my developer existence. So, looking all the way back to the early 1990s, in the beginning there was Visual Basic, a rapid application development environment for 16-bit and later 32-bit windows. It was a monolith that kind of got gradually priced apart but always stayed pretty much tied to its own proprietary runtime. And as things like Java began, began competing with it, Microsoft decided they wanted to do another language. And they figured out that if they were going to do that, they should share a runtime, because then you could have lots of other languages on those as well. Um, and thus was the common language runtime born, also known because marketing at the time, .NET. So initially, .NET was released as a, as a Windows framework. Um, it was closed source, but it was a specification submitted to ECMA, and that meant that other implementers could come along. The Mono project implemented .NET for Linux. Later on, and we don't like to talk about this too much, um, <laughs> there was Silverlight, which was a cross-platform implementation of a subset of .NET to run in the browser. And then when Microsoft began embracing open source a bit more, there was .NET Core, which is now actually the primary development stream of .NET. That is fully cross-platform, Linux, Mac, Windows, um, and is a, a much sort of smaller refocused version of the, the framework. And then a few years ago, Steve Sanderson from Microsoft figured out that they could compile the .NET runtime, they could compile this, this, this execution environment to WebAssembly and run it in the browser. And that was called Blazor. So, and I want to just shift and give you some context on how this all works. When you write C-sharp code, or F-sharp, or VB.net, or whatever, and compile that, you end up with these blobs of what's called intermediate language, CIL, Common Intermediate Language, bundled into assemblies. And those are self-described, they've got metadata, they can talk to each other, and together they form an application. That intermediate language is not machine code, it's more like Java bytecode, um, and it's run by an execution engine uh, called the virtual execution system, and that sits over the host. That's the classic .NET model. When we take that to Blazor, all we need to do, all we need to do, <laughs> is to recompile the execution engine um, from targeting machine code, from, 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 from x86 instructions to WASM instructions. And then you get an execution environment that's able to run these IL instructions in the browser. Now, recently, Steve Sanderson has added WASI support via a project called the .NET WASI SDK, an experimental project, I should probably stress, called the .NET WASI SDK. And this is going to allow .NET applications to run, to be compiled to WASM on the, the server. Now, notice once again, still, we've got the IL blobs, the DLLs, the assemblies, but now we've got a WASI host, such as WASM time instead of a browser, and it means that the standard library, the base class library, can do things like file I.O. by talking to the WASI interface rather than having to drop it on the, drop it on the floor or fail. The WASI SDK has one limitation from, certainly from Fermion's point of view, which is that it's a it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a WASI start model, underscore start, which means that the execution comes in the top, runs to the bottom, and then exits. That's not what we need for the future of the, the component model and WASM interface types. 
what we need is something more like this, where in addition to the IL blobs talking to each other, they can also talk to services that are exported, they can import services exported by the host, and they can provide callable interfaces that the host can enter instead of just the, the start point. And this is coming back to Luke's worlds concept. The, the host now is sort of, it, or is or implements a world which the .NET components live in and satisfy the, the contracts of. So, this opens up additional potential because we can now talk to other components in that same world via their contracts. And that means we're not limited to talking .NET to .NET or .NET to host. We can also talk, for example, .NET to Joel. We can use the work that Joel did to build, say, some business rules we've got in Java into a WASM module. And then we can have our .NET application using those business rules via the WASM interface. We don't care that it's Java on the other side. We don't care that it's built from Rust or C or Go or Java or whatever. It's all WASM. It's all WASM interface types. So that's the, that's the rainbow dream. But there's always a but. So if we look inside the WASI SDK, what we find is that um, it's got, it, the WASI SDK hijacks .NET compilation. Instead of just putting out a, 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 a .NET DLL, an IL blob, it actually puts out a, it actually adds in some C code, which gets compiled to WASM, and it's the C code that talks to, that loads the .NET blobs, as opposed to the, the raw VS. So the WASI SDK exposes an underscore start, or a C main method, that's compiled to C. That method, that piece of C code, launches the mono implementation of the .NET CLR and asks it to load the user's assembly and call its main. And that's all hardwired into the WASI SDK. What we want is something more like this, where we can have C code that exposes .NET exports and consume, sorry, that, that exports WASM interfaces and can consume, can import WASM interfaces that are exported by the host. Now within that export entry point, we need to launch the VES and that can then launch the user implementation and find the right entry point for that. And then those can call back, we can map C-sharp libraries, C-sharp methods onto C methods and those can then call back through the, 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 the generated, generated import layer. Is that making sense so far? Any questions so far? All right, so what you see here is what can kind of be called Franken code. It's a mix of C sharp for the user application, the, the, the user code, and C for those interop layers. And I'm now going to see how far I can get with building one of these things live. So what I've got here, what I've got here is um, some WASM interface files. I've got a, um, an export thing. So this is going to handle console triggers. It's going to handle a line of input and I want it to return a line of output. Well, first of all, I'll start by creating myself a project. So that's just created a new empty.NET project. And then I'm going to use the whip bind gen tool that Luke alluded to. 
and I'm going to say I wanted to create exports from wit slash console.wit and I'm going to put them inside that project. So what have we Out oh dear, thank you very much. So what have we got coming out from that? Um, in our life, we've got this native and we've got this console.c and console.h. And in that console.c, because it's an export, you'll see it's exporting this function from the C code. That's going to get compiled down to WASM and it's going to become a WASM export. And inside that function it does some marshalling and then it calls this function, which if we were to look through the C code, we would find that that function was not defined anywhere. We've got to define that. And to do that, we will have some custom C code, which I will add there. So what's this doing? Well, you can see there's a bunch of hash includes of the, the mono source there. So we're loading, we're going to be loading the, the mono source. I'll um, scroll down to the, the end here. So this is the missing function. This is going to get linked by the, the clan compiler, which is invoked by the WASI SDK. This is going to get linked with that export, that whip bind gen export code. And that means that when our host calls that export, we will go through that C marshalling code and we will end up here. And what does this do? Well, it does some sorcery. It does some stuff we prefer not to talk about because that's supposed to be internals, but it doesn't work if we don't do that. And then it initializes the CLR. It loads the runtime. It does some stuff called attaching internal calls, which we don't need yet, so we can probably get rid of that. And then it tries to find an entry point in the user code. Now, this is where things get a little bit sticky because there's no obvious entry point as there is with main. So how are we going to solve that? Well, a, a common way of doing that in .NET is to either implement a marker interface or to use an attribute. For the way that I've done it um, in my project, I've used an attribute. So I'm going to need to add that declaration to my project as well. And for those of you who know, there's, there's nothing really going on there. It's just a mark. It's just a way of labeling a method. And I'm also going to need the, the hairy bit that finds the method, which I've not made a snippet for. So let's go copy that out from, from here. So come on, see. And we'll drop that into the native directory. Um, this is doing a, a whole bunch of effectively reflection, but it's doing reflection from the, the mono hosting side. So it's using mono APIs to inspect the .NET assembly and find something that's decorated with that attribute. So now, I should be able to go in here and write public static um, string my handler string input and that should get called. Uh, sorry, I need to add a Eight. 
and that namespace so it all shows up. All right, now we need to get it to compile all that stuff together because we've we referenced the WASI SDK. We need to tell the WASI SDK that there are some additional files that we need to bring in. And that's handled by this targets file, which says, I want you to include the console.c I want you to include my console.c and my util.c. And I'm also going to need to, to include that console export, the thing that's actually handling the, um, the entry point. And then I will need to reference those in my csproj file. So I'll just, again, copy those from a previous version. So I'll need to have those in my project. And I will also need to And I'm also going to need to add the package. tell why I don't like to do this too often. All right, so that's added the WASI SDK. That will take care of handing compilation duties over to, to Clang. Um, and now we can give this a go and see how it works out. And this is kind of calling back to what we heard earlier about wanting to use familiar tools. This does work with just .NET build. There's no special WASM compilation. It's all taken care of by the WASI SDK. So let's see what we've see what we've missed. Okay, what we've missed is that C strings are not .NET strings. So if I look in my console.h, the type that's being passed across the boundary is one of these. It's a, it's a pointer and a length. And that's not a .NET string. So I need to actually map something that corresponds, to, I need to have something that corresponds to that on the C sharp side so that things can be passed across correctly. And the way I can do that is by creating a struct, a C sharp struct. that represents that canonical ABI format. So you can see there, it's got the, the pointer and the length, and it's marked as sequential layout. And what that means is it's telling the C-sharp compiler that that struct should adopt the, the C ABI. It should be laid out in memory according to the C ABI. Um, and then there's some help methods on there that can convert it to and from strings. So now I can switch back to my, my application code. This needs to return an an interrupt string, and it needs to take. an interrupt string, and for the time being, 
I'll do I'll return interrupt string dot from string Just save that and All right. and we'll try that again. All right, unsafe code. That means that I need to also allow unsafe code to be a thing, which means I need to go back in here and I need to allow unsafe blocks true. And we'll try building that again. And now the C-sharp has built successfully and what it's doing is it's, building, it's, it's built those DLLs, including all the dependency DLLs, and it's now trying to link those with the, the C code. And when it fails, it does tend to produce these very long error messages. All right, this is a little bit of a silly issue that's caused by Whitbind Gen. The way that it generates these things, it creates the wrong include statement for the .h file. So we just need to massage that generated code, which I, we always hate doing, but we've not found a workaround for that yet. And I will switch back to my pre-prepared one. Thank you for your patience, but <laughs> I was getting a bit over-optimistic there. So let's switch back to .NET guest and .NET build that one. And this is what you've seen except without the, the mistakes. It's the same, same code that you've, you've just been looking at. So how can I use this? Well, I've got a little host program written in, in Rust um, that loads, um, that just loads, um, loads WASM time um, and calls through that, that export. So it's just looping, reading a line from the console and when it gets one, it calls into, into, it calls for an export. So I'm going to, um, change up. I will go dot host target release host, and I'll pass it the WASM file that I want to use as a command line argument, which is going to be dot net guest bin debug net 7.0 uh, wasm day <laughs> I forgot my own namespace now wasm day dot net thank you For some reason, I'm not getting completion on that argument. So, Rust, the Rust host is now waiting for a command, and I will give it a command of joke, and that's now calling into my application here. So we've received a line, I've matched the line on joke, and that is now calling out via 
a, an import the random thing import. So I'm just constructing a, and again, this is one of these interop structures, and then I'm passing that to this call. What's that? That's got this internal call decoration on. That means it's a call that is implemented by the runtime itself, by the, by the execution system itself. Um, which, and this is how we achieve imports, because if I go and look for where that's done, I can see that that internal call is attached to... Oh, is attached to a C function, and that C function has been generated by another whip bind gen that's in here. And that whip bind gen then backs out onto a service that's implemented in the world of the Rust host. All right, does that make sense? I'm sorry, that's been a little bit, I've shown that in a slightly confusing way. Does it, does it make sense to people how that's hanging together, that we've got the, the C-generated code um, forming the interface to the, to the host, to the world, exporting and importing things? This binding layer of C interop stuff, like the interop string and the internal core, melding that into the C-sharp.net world, and then the application being able to handle those callbacks and call out through the interop. Yes? Can I come back? It's a great question. Can I come back to... So the question was about can we generate the bindings in C Sharp? And I will come back to that in just a moment. So thank you. Any other questions around that? All right. So, let's talk about challenges. Where are we at with this? Well, one challenge that we hit quite hard when we were working with this for spin was startup time. The, the .NET design is, is aimed at amortizing startup time. You, you, you expect it to be a long-running process. It takes a while to spin up the runtime maybe sort of 30, 40 milliseconds, something like that. Um, but then each call should be quite quick. But in a, in a WASM environment, in a world-like environment, where your export is being called quite frequently, you don't have the res you, it's, it's wasteful to spin .NET up every time. The solution that we have for that is to use a tool called Wiser. And we can, and if you look in the spin.net scale, which I'll put a link to, Wiser allows us to run the module to a certain point. So what we can do is we can, in our Wiser function, we can start the runtime, load the assemblies, inject a fake request to warm up the actual handler, and then capture the state of the module at that point. And that means that every request that goes to that captured version of the module is going into something that's already pre-warmed and ready to go. So it's not a great workaround, and there are some weird side effects which are documented in the Spin SDK, um, but it, it certainly helps a lot in a lot of cases. Um, stability is a problem that I've hit to the point of banging my head against the desk a few times. Um, we're doing some kind of fairly hairy C magic here um, in an experimental environment. And I've certainly hit a few kind of mismatch signature, which I just don't know how to resolve. A lot of those do seem to be down to wiser, but again, not fully understood yet. Size is a bit of a problem at the moment. The, the generated binaries are about 20 megs for Hello World, which is not out of proportion for some of those big runtimes but it does allocate a whole lot of memory. 
um, a whole lot of WASM linear memory, um, which we've had to work around. Um, future versions of the WASI SDK should improve that. And the one that you so rightly identified, convenience. You do not, you do not want to go through what I just went through on a regular basis, um, even if you know what you're doing. Um, the, the, the process of generating the C files, setting up all the linkage, linkages, um, writing those interop bridges and writing the, the gunky stuff on the C, C sharp side is a mess. Where we would like to be is to be able to generate those C sharp bindings directly, which would be a WIP bind gen back end, and then somehow from there generate the C bridging or the, the equivalent ABI level bridging stuff, which might be doable within .NET, or we might be able to, we might need to use something like Roslyn source generators to spit out that C code and make sure it gets linked in. So there's some definite tooling improvements that absolutely need to be done before this can be production ready. And with that, I'll say, go play with it. We've got an SDK for, work, for working with .NET with C Sharp in Spin. You can just add it as a NuGet package and use it in Spin today. But I hope what I've shown you is also relevant, even if you're not interested in, in working with .NET, I hope that this is illustrated a technique that you could be able to use for other languages, for supporting those worlds and interfaces in other languages that don't compile down directly to WASM, that, that, that live inside these runtimes. And with that, I'll leave you some links. The, the working code is in that top repo, the WASM Day 22 one, um, the spin.net one, which illustrates a more real world use case and illustrates the wisering technique um, is in spin.net SDK. And I need to acknowledge the foundational work that Steve Sanderson has done with the WASI SDK. Thank you very much. Any questions for Ivan? All right, thank you so much, Ivan. Thank Appreciate you. it. All right, our next two speakers are no strangers to open source by any means. Uh, Daniel um, uh, is a serial entrepreneur in his own right and was the past founder of Bitnami. And Raphael, uh, among his many other things, uh, they're both now in the VMware office of the CTO, uh, worked on KDE for like forever, right? Like 16 years? Yeah, I'm Long time. So blame him for all the Linux presentation issues not working today, I think. <laughs> 